Okay, so uh, welcome everyone and thanks for, for joining. I think initially I thought there would be a lot of uh, webinar fatigue at this point, but we have a good, good turnout. So thanks for joining. And I think uh, we're, we're hoping to have a good discussion on this issue. Um, so first I'll just kind of introduce myself and then explain what we're doing this webinar. And then I'll introduce the speakers who we're going to talk throughout the, the for this panel. So, so my name is Shamil Azmi. I'm a lecturer at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. Uh, I coordinate the group on global production networks, trade and labor within the institute, where a lot of people do work related to trade, labor, global value chains issues, global production issues, uh, amongst others. So uh, the idea of this webinar emerged within kind of discussions within that group in which we've been having about the implications of the COVID-19 crisis on kind of the global map of production and trade and, and global value chains. Uh, and, and just kind of fit to give you a bit of background to this discussion we're having within the group is basically the, the last few decades I've experienced this expansion of global value chains as a way to coordinate global production and trade, also as a policy framework for a lot of developing countries try and seek uh, development policy, industrial policies linked to value chain, and also as a research framework that we use to analyze different kind of sectors, different issues related to trade and labor. Um, in recent years, we're starting to see some challenges and some debates to this model, including rising protectionism in some countries, rising kind of unpredictability in the global system, uh, growing kind of discussion around reshoring and to what extent robotics and automation could eliminate the need for, for low cost labor. So COVID-19 to us came in this, in this moment that was already, there were already some tensions within this kind of global system. Uh, some people argue that we're gonna see kind of a decline in that global model as a result of what's going on. Other people argue that kind of global integration is already too deep. It's already uh, it's too strong to be able to kind of decline or be reversed. And you know, a lot of people argue it's somewhere in between. We might see a bit of shift in global maps, maybe more regional kind of integration, a decline of global integration. Um, so, so what we thought about is bringing different people to discuss this, hopefully from different perspective and also possibly with different arguments around, around this issue. Uh, I'm gonna first introduce the speakers briefly and then I'll give a bit more uh, description when we get to each of, of, of the speakers. So, so first we have Stephanie Barrientos, who's a professor at GDI here, who's going to be talking about COVID-19 impacts on women workers and global value chains. Uh, I'll introduce Stephanie more when we, when we get to her talk. The second talk will be by Dev Nathan, who's going to be talking about uh, reorganization of value chains in the age of surveillance capitalism, the impact of concentrated knowledge in hyperscale, hyperscale. Uh, thirdly, we're going to have Rory Horner, who's a senior lecturer at, at the department. Again, I'll introduce him more. He's going to be talking about the pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical GVCs and COVID-19, which has been one of the big issues that a lot of this political and economic discussion has been about. And finally, we have Professor Rafi Kaplinski, who's going to be talking about the future of GVCs. To what extent do we see a trend toward localization of production? For each speaker, I'll go more in details when I present each of them. A few housekeeping uh, kind of kind of points. So automatically, you're going to be on mute. Uh, if you're not, please turn on mute, just to kind of avoid any background noise. Um, in, we're going to record the session, but not the Q&A. So in case you don't want to be recorded at all, you could turn off your camera. I think a lot of people, most people turned off their cameras already, so that's fine. Uh, if you have any questions, please keep them to the Q&A sessions, uh, except if it's a clarification question, you could put them in the chat box, either publicly or direct them to me. I'll try and pick them up and direct them to the speaker when, when they finish their presentation. Um, in terms of time, each speaker would have eight to 10 minutes to present. Then we're going to have move to the next speaker, do all the kind of the different talks, except if there is a clarification question and then move to a Q&A session. Uh, so our first speaker is, is uh, Professor Stephanie Barrientos. So uh, Stephanie is, is professor at GDI. She's been working for, for, for years on issues related to value chains, labor, gender upgrading. She published a book on gender and work in global value chains, capturing the gains, which kind of examined some of these dynamics, and also had a, long, a large project on capturing the gains in global value chains. So I hand it over to Stephanie to start the, 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 the discussion. 
Right, thank you very much. Can you see the um, slides on the screen okay? Great, thank you very much for the invitation to, to participate in this panel. It's a really great panel and I think it's considering the implications for um, of carbon and global value chains is really critical given the impact that that COVID has had and, and how critical value chains uh, in, di in disrupting value chains and how critical that's been for uh, consumers, workers, everybody in so many countries. Um, just looking very briefly, I've been involved in some research on uh, part of the DFID um, work and opportunities for women in global value chain program. Um, I've been doing some some research on, on desk-based and, and uh, virtual research um, on uh, the impact on, on particularly on women workers. So I'll just talk to give a few of the highlights of, of what we found. Firstly, just very briefly that um, uh, in, in terms of the sort of data and information we have on numbers of workers in global value chains, it's not very good. Um, we know that in 40 OECD countries, there are um, over 450 million jobs in global value chains, 42% of those female, but and really importantly, that excludes lower income countries, lower value chain tiers, casual, informal, unpaid family labor. And just as an example, Bangladesh is not included yet, 4 million jobs are in Bangladesh uh, uh, ready-made garments, 65 to 70% of those are female. So we can see that the, the, the data isn't very good before COVID hit. Now, COVID, we do know from a macro impact, has had a big impact on workers. The ILO reckons or estimates that 155 million full-time equivalent jobs have been um, uh, affected globally, and that women are particularly in high-risk sectors and are therefore being disadvantaged, um, uh, disproportionately um, uh, affected. Uh, South Africa, a, a very recent, very excellent um, research has just come out from U University of Cape Town that shows nationally 3 million jobs have been lost or uh, uh, di uh, directly affected and two thirds of those 2 million are women. But what we don't know, um, and it's very difficult to get data and is specifically what have been the impact on workers, uh, 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 but on women in particular, given that they do constitute a significant proportion of labor intensive value chains. So just a, a few of the findings that, that, that um, we've got from this very rough and ready research. Um, firstly, I think very importantly is that there's been a cascade effect. So if we're thinking of the value chain across, uh, very simplified um, across inputs, production, distribution, retail through to the final customer, um, a, a disruption in one place can have a big effect um, later on or at a different point uh, at another point in the chain. And um, particularly for just in time value chains that operate on such tight margins uh, or tight turnaround times, this can be important. So for example, um, the uh, disruption to, um, to uh, logistics and transport to containers getting stuck in China, air, air transport being, um, uh, passenger transport being uh, hit and therefore freight that went in the hold of passenger planes was hit. So there were a lot of disruptions in one place which had an effect on others. Ready-made garments was uh, a, a sector that got really badly affected. Um, it's non-essential. Um, there are approximately 60 million workers globally in ready-made garments. Um, and uh, garments and textiles, um, and approximately 70% of those globally are female. Um, but garments got hit very early on, particularly with textiles being disrupted in China. Uh, millions and millions of workers were, were, were pushed out of, of work. Uh, migrant workers, many of them are internal migrant workers, were forced to go back to their own villages or their, their places of origin. Um, immediate loss of income. A lot of the big buyers um, uh, uh, refused to pay for orders, even orders that were already in produced and in transit. And therefore, there were um, not insufficient money to, to give workers any income. Uh, so there were some enormous losses. Um, civil society pressure um, on buyers led to some of them uh, re-establishing uh, those old payments and some schemes were then set up rapidly to try and get incomes through to workers. 
but we know that men, women workers, especially given the, the feminization of that sector, were very badly affected. And there were issues around women being going back into the home, around um, gender, um, domestic violence and being subjected to other pressures as well as the problems for their households, just simply being able to find enough income to, to, food, to eat. Uh, Agri-food, very different um, story, a more, more mixed story. Food, uh, my focus is on fresh fruit and vegetables, cocoa, tea, coffee, uh, but um, a different story. Uh, food is essential um, and therefore a lot of production did continue and distribution did continue, except um, where it was going into um, into uh, food service, such as cafes, restaurants, etc. That closed down. Uh, again, a very high proportion of women work in food, particularly in processing and packing. Some countries, 70%, even 80%, um, particularly in Africa, which is a major producer, off-season producer, um, selling into Europe. Um, the uh, effects, though, were nonetheless important because of uh, food, uh, health and safety, um, there, there had to be less workers in place at any one time. Workers were put on to different shifts um, of, and made with about half the amount of hours in many lo locations and therefore ha had their income halved. And there were big serious issues around the health and safety um, of workers. So just in the interest of time, oh dear, that's not wanting to move. Sorry, I got uh, that. So, um, uh, so just uh, in the interest of time, just what are the implications um, of all of this? Firstly, um, obviously we know about the GVC disruption, but governments, particularly in developing countries and, and everywhere and in Europe and North America, have really been flailing around in terms of how to deal with the social impact um, and, and economic and social impact um, of, uh, of COVID. Uh, social protection schemes, emergency relief schemes tend to support uh, workers uh, on the whole who are in regular employment with good contracts, but women are particularly concentrated in casual work, more insecure work, and have less access to these types of schemes. Um, the GVC impacts really varied a little bit by, by value chain. I've just given the example of garments versus food, but also by tier. So at the higher tiers of the value chain, the, the large processors, packers, etc., workers, including often a large proportion of women workers, are more likely to be on regular contracts, to be audited, uh, to have uh, the, the rights to insurance, etc. But at the lower tiers, especially small scale producers, um, contributing family labor in, in, uh, on small scale farms, informal workers, much less likely to have um, social protection um, or, or, any, or be, get access to emergency relief. And again, it, it varied by country. In terms of, uh, of the overall impact, what is exposed is, COVID is exposed is the fragility of value chains, but also the inequality of, uh, uh, of value chains, um, systemic inequality, where the risks and the costs are pushed downwards and women workers especially are in the, in the parts of the value chain uh, concentrating parts of the value chain where there's the most vulnerability and the least protection. But and just to finish, I think it's very important that, that we also think about going forward and the potential. The potential. Um, there's a lot of restructuring going on in value chains, and I'm sure further Blaker speakers will talk about this, especially regionalization, formation of just in case rather than just in time value chains. But there's also a lot of talk about building back better and generating more resilient um, value chains. Um, the first thing though is, is, is how can you build back better to help all the most, including the most vulnerable. A number of people, uh, Danny Roderick and others are talking about the development of a new social contract where you really have greater harm and, uh, uh, alliances between the private sector, public and, and civil society to ensure that, that not only is the value chains more resilient, but also there's better protection, job and social protection for all workers. Now, in terms of the how, my view though, working coming from a gender perspective is gender equality has never been promoted automatically. It's something that women in the long run have always historically had to fight for. And therefore we need to contest 
in order to get the better building back, there has to be contestation at local, national and global levels. And from my own perspective, and given the importance of women workers in global value chains, gender, promoting gender equality is absolutely critical to that process. So I'll finish there. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so uh, there's no urgent question or clarification in the, in, in, in the chat. So, so I'm, I'm going to move directly to the second speaker, and then we go back to, to some of these issues that Stephanie raised. I think it will be interesting the point around the different sectors impact. Why do we see that impact across sectors? It'll be interesting to kind of understand a bit more. Uh, our second speaker is, is, is Dev Nathan. Dev Nathan, who is going to be speaking about the reorganization of GVCs in the age of surveillance surveillance capitalism, the impact of concentrated knowledge in the hyperscale. Dev is a visiting professor at the Institute of Human Development in New Delhi. He's also the research director at the Gendev Center in India. And he, his recent book, I think, was published this year, uh, Witch Hunt, Culture, Patriarchy, and Structural Transformation, which was uh, published earlier in this year, I think. Uh, so I'll hand over to Dev, and please keep to the eight to 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to GDI for the invitation. Yes, I will try and stick to the eight to 10 minutes. I would look at what really have been trends which predated the pandemic, but have been accelerated now with this pandemic. The main trends are with relation to the use of digital technologies of different trends. One of them is the resulting in, the, in automated manufacture. The second one is that of work from home. And third is the growth of e-commerce. So I'll take these three one by one. Now, it has been said, for instance, by the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, that two years of digitization have been accomplished in just two months. Now we are four months into this pandemic and perhaps it's been four to five years of digitization, which has been accomplished, including, for instance, this conference or this webinar that we are having. So what has been the impact of that? The first is in the realm of manufacturing, that there is a move to a higher levels of automated manufacturing, even in labor intensive industries. So for instance, you have an Adidas factory in Germany, which is making shoes with maybe 150 to 200 employees. They manufacture about half a million pairs of shoes in a year. There is a, a shoe bot t-shirt manufacturer in North Carolina, which manufactures a t-shirt for 33 cents a piece, which is lower than the unit cost with say, low wage labor in Bangladesh. What does this show? You can't compete against automated manufacturing with low wage labor. You will have to change your technology. And overall, there will be a fall in the employment intensity of manufacturing. So. It will not, you will not have a repetition of what happened in China, where the labor intensive manufacturing on a very large scale was really the driver of growth for quite a long while. Now, the result of this automated manufacturing is that one, it is leading to onshoring, whether it's in North Carolina or Germ Germany, but I would point out that onshoring does not mean no value chains. You can have value chain manufacture with specialized manufacturers who are different from the designers or the retailers. So that is the essence of the value chain story. And it doesn't necessarily disappear with onshoring or nearshoring. Now, there's also one more trend that is of regionalization. The Americas, then China, and perhaps Japan and India together, all trying to develop regional value chains but I would point out that a high part of this is not driven by simple economics. It is a geostrategic question. As we know, the conflict between the uh, USA and China for world hegemony and the struggle to see who will dominate the new technology of the world, the struggle over Huawei or India canceling all Chinese contracts for various levels of types of manufacture. These are all geostrategic. They are not simple economic matters. So we need to bring in the geostrategic questions of the struggle over the world for, for the world hegemony and its redistribution when we talk of the reorganization of value chains. The second trend which we see is that of work from home. Well, like all of us are doing right now as we participate in this uh, webinar. Now work from home has become a 
a new normal, I will say, in, for instance, the Indian IT industry. Our Indian IT majors have said that they will continue to work for a, well, as long as they exist, with 75% of their workforce working from home. That is going to be the new normal in the service industries. And there will be one benefit of this, which is that it'll, women will benefit from this working from home. As we know, it was always a problem for women to get promoted because they could not so easily accept transfers as men could. Now, if you're going to work from home, it doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're in London or Delhi or in, in Bangalore. You might as well be anywhere and do the same kind of work. So that is the next trend, the work from home. The third one and the major one, and which I think is of very important strategic, very strategically important for value chains, is that of the growth of e-commerce. Here too, it's been seen that in eight weeks, e-commerce has grown more than in the previous decade. The big platforms have, of course, benefited the most. Alibaba now accounts for one sixth of China's retail sales. That's a huge figure. It's not small. It's not even large scale. That's why I'm using the term hyperscale. In one day, in a couple of years ago, Alibaba carried out 250 million transactions. That's something we can't even think of. How can anyone, in one day, what they call the singles day, Amazon, who is the largest retailer of garments in the world? It is Amazon. It's not Zara. It's not anybody else. It is Amazon. So what does this mean? It means we now are in a period which has been called the age of surveillance capital. I'll come to why that is called surveillance capital in a minute. But we have hyper enterprises, which I would like to define as those who deal with more than 200 million subscribers or customers. But importantly, they are oligopolies in more than one market, unlike the Zara's or uh, m and or any other, uh, any other commodity producer that we know. The new oligopolies are oligopolies in multiple markets. Amazon is not just in book sales. They're in sales. They are in uh, in e-commerce of every kind. They are in cloud services. They are big wherever they are. Now, how do these things come together? They come together because of the what is called big data. Data is transferred from one type of behavior or one market to another. We are seeing this now happening in India where we find a new hyper enterprise growing. This is India's, well, already a, a giant, that is the Reliance Company, which has now 400 subscribers in their telecom network, but they're going to link this through WhatsApp with the retail section of Reliance. So you'll have about maybe 10 million small grocery shops being linked through retail, Reliance Retail with the telecom network. So there'll be the data, the personal data from one domain will be transferred across to another domain. And that is why it is called surveillance capitalism, where the where these big platforms are able to watch us and be able to track all our movements and all our actions and link them. And they're able to utilize it in a way, unlike the earlier systems in, in artificial intelligence, more is better. The more data you have, the better you're going to be in predicting. So the larger they are, they have the network effects, they have the effect of very concentrated knowledge and they're able to use that to build oligopolies across different sectors. This is a new kind of enterprise, which we have not seen before. It's been there for a while, but it's now beginning to impact the world, I think. And I would like to now look forward. Okay, how is it going to have an effect on value chains? Is something going to change in that? For instance, now, whatever the name of the publisher, whether it is, well, I work with Cambridge University Press in the GVC series or in this Wish, Wish Hunt's book they have just published. But whichever the publisher they have to sell on Amazon, it doesn't matter what the name of the publisher is, they have to sell on Amazon. In India, and perhaps it is so in the UK also and other countries, all restaurants have to work through food aggregators. They cannot only depend on their own sales. And this will surely have increased through the lockdowns and all of the, uh, the turmoil which we've had over the last three to four months. Now in this situation, 
who will become stronger, who, which is, who has a stronger bargaining position. Yes, a brand which has its own online sales will of course be stronger than one that only depends upon Amazon or the Indian Flipkart, by the way, which is owned by Walmart or Alibaba. I mean, what kind of bargaining power will a small brand have with Amazon or Alibaba when they can decide on prices, when they can decide when they're going to offer a discount? You know, the Indian restaurants tried to get away from the aggregators because they were being pushed to offer discounts as they fought for market share but they couldn't really manage it. And now it'll be even worse. They will not be able to stay away from these food aggregators. So are we going to see a new kind of brand developing, a hyper brand, Amazon, Alibaba, or Alliance? Will they be the hyper lead firms? That is a question I would like to pose that will deal with lower level lead firms, which we have been used to calling lead firms so far in the GVC analysis. Will these hyper lead firms begin to set not just prices and discounts, but also begin to set labor, gender, and environmental standards? Will we have a centralized hyper system, which will also be subject to some kinds of consumer pressure, where you now don't have to deal with a large number of brands say, in garments, but if there can be enough pressure brought on Amazon or Alibaba or Reliance, you can force them in turn to bring pressure on the brands who deal on their platforms. So I think that these are new things which are coming up and we need to, if we, as we go forward in looking at how value chains are going to develop, we have to see how the relations will develop between these hyper enterprises and those which have been lead firms or lead brands for so long. Thank you, I will end with that. Okay, thanks a lot, Dev. I, th I think there was a number of the issues that we, we, we discussed before that are important to our, to our debate. So issue of, of reshoring or the technology side in terms of automation, in terms of new technologies that could save the low wage cost advantage that some countries have also regionalization trend, and also I think which is very important, the data economy, the rise of digital trade platforms and how they're shaping, again, these kind of maps of production. So thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna move, there are no specific questions as far as I could see. Um, so I'm gonna move to the third speaker, who's uh, Rory Horner. Uh, Rory's gonna talk about pharmaceutical GVCs and COVID-19, the crisis and beyond. So pharmaceutical as, you probably mostly seen has become one of the hot topics where the risks of global value chain has been highlighted by countries saying we can't believe our medicine is being produced elsewhere and there's this push for it to potentially being the first sector where we see that push for protectionism trying to achieve the kind of disintegration of the value chain so rory's been working on that i think recently got much more attention in terms of the COVID, which is very good. Uh, Rory is a senior lecturer at GDI. He works on issues related to global production networks, role of the state, focusing on the pharma sector. He's concluding a three years research project uh, that is com kind of com comparing Indian pharmaceutical and locally manufactured medicine in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I'll leave it to you, Rory. Thanks, Shamil, uh, and, and good uh, to be here. So pharmaceuticals is distinctive in some ways from, from other sectors in that while other sectors have had somewhat of a, of a fall or even a collapse in demand, pharmaceuticals is an area where particular drugs have come under, in a sense, unprecedented demand because of their potential to, to mitigate the pandemic. And the pandemic has really highlighted and brought to much wider public attention the, the nature of globalization in the pharmaceutical industry. So I, I just have a brief uh, uh, diagram here of the different stages in pharmaceutical production, but essentially there's two main stages in the manufacturing of drugs. The manufacture of APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, and then also the manufacture of formulations or finished drugs where a a, an ingredient is, is formulated into a liquid, a tablet, a capsule for human consumption. China plays a huge role in the global production of active pharmaceutical ingredients. This is a very chemical intensive process and uh, China is, is a major supplier to, to much of the world, including to India, but India has a particular specialization in the production of generic formulations. It's known to some as 
the pharmacy of the developing world for its role in supplying low-cost medicines, most notice, noticeably antiretrovirals to, to many countries in the global south, but, but many say it's actually pharmacy to the world because it's not just supplying generic medicines to the global south, but also to the global north too. Uh, many for a considerable time have been aware of the considerable reliance on China in particular for the supply of active pharmaceutical ingredients. And the US government has had different uh, reports and investigations over the last decade into the extent of this dependence. India, which uh, has a very still flourishing formulation segment of the industry, has also itself become quite reliant for about 70% of its active pharmaceutical ingredients on China. And it too has had inquiries in the last couple of years into the dependence on China. So. Uh, the, many, many in the know have been aware of the extent of, of dependence on China for active pharmaceutical ingredients pre-pandemic, uh, ju just to highlight as a starting point. The initial concern with the outbreak of the pandemic in China was of potential shutdowns in, in China and their subsequent knock-on effects on supply chains elsewhere, including in India uh, and other places which are reliant on ingredients from China. For the most part, many pharmaceutical companies maintain a few months of inventory and the way the lockdowns have been managed have been largely managed to keep pharmaceutical production going. So although there's been some fall in production volumes, for the most part on the supply side, production has largely been able to be maintained. But what has been really uh, a huge factor shaping this industry has been the enormous rise in demand for certain drugs. And this is something not just a huge spike in demand for pharmaceuticals. We've seen it as well with personal protective equipment uh, for, for masks, for example, where the global demand has just absolutely soared. And the first drug which really got a lot of attention this way is hydroxychloroquine. It's a longstanding anti-malarial drug. India produces about 70% of the world's hydroxychloroquine. And this initially, uh, when this drug was getting a lot of attention in, in mid to late March, uh, India actually put in place an export restriction on the export of hydroxychloroquine. And this sort of raised concerns and, and triggered fears elsewhere about the potential for nationalist approaches to policy making and controlling the supply of global value chains for domestic markets. Uh, for the most part, though, uh, there was considerable pushback against this. Very quickly, the Indian government announced that companies which had advanced market commitments to supply elsewhere would still be able to maintain that supply. They also allowed certain countries to receive supply under humanitarian grants. There was also a huge geopolitical backlash against this. Donald Trump in the White House threatened retaliation. Of course, we know he himself has, has come clean that he's been taking this as his own treatment uh, for, for COVID-19 as well or as a preventative. Uh, he there was it became a big diplomatic uh, spat. Eventually, India relented and allowed export of hydroxychloroquine elsewhere. But this did raise to prominence, and we saw this with other aspects of medical equipment, the potential that countries which are major pro producers in global value chains could corner production for themselves in the time of a pandemic. Uh, India has also been central is central to the production of other drugs which have been potentially touted as treatments for COVID-19. Remdesivir is, is an antiviral drug which received some approval previously for treatment of Ebola. Uh, Gilead has a patent for this drug. Noticeably, this drug had no demand. No, it wasn't even being produced essentially anywhere in the world at the beginning of 2020. Yet uh, by mid-February, Gilead is doing trials in Wuhan on patients in China who have COVID-19 to see it, its potential, explore its potential as an effective treatment, uh, and, and it has received some emergency authorization use in the US and elsewhere. As Gilead has a patent, this has raised a lot of questions about whether uh, many other uh, patients and countries elsewhere around the world will get access to it. Noticeably, India, even before any voluntary license was were issued, there was a lot of uh, featuring in the Indian media of a number of Indian companies already developing and working on this drug to supply it to India. In May, Gilead announced uh, nine companies would be given voluntary licenses to produce this drug. Seven of these companies are based in India. And this is licenses for 127 
low and middle income countries. Noticeably, Latin America has been excluded from those voluntary licenses. So again, if, if the world is to get access to this COVID-19 treatment, India is going to play a major role. Uh, the final drug I just mentioned briefly, dexamethasone, it, uh, a UK study a few weeks ago uh, featured this anti-inflammatory steroid and its potential as a treatment. None of these drugs are doing miracles. They're all largely just so far making a relatively minor improvements uh, and, are, and are not uh, pure, uh, they're not, they're not going to work miracles in, in fighting COVID-19, but they're supposed to be better better than nothing. Again, India produces about 46% of the world's uh, dexamethasone. So for, for if, if people are to get access to that drug, India too is going to play a major role. Similarly, for the COVID-19 vaccine, there's currently 24 vaccines in human trials around the world. Uh, there's two that are, are, are particularly advanced. One, uh, a Chinese uh, vaccine produced by Sinopharm that's going through trials. But the, the world's most advanced vaccine candidate, according to Sumya Swaminathan, the WHO chief scientist, is uh, developed by the Jenner Institute at the University of Oxford. AstraZeneca has the worldwide uh, licensing, marketing, and distribution rights. But again, they have partnered with Serum Institute of India, which is, in volume terms, the world's largest supplier of vaccines. It's estimated 60% of people in the world have, have received vaccines from uh, Serum Institute. Uh, and they have a deal with AstraZeneca to supply 1 billion doses of this vaccine by the end of 2021. Essentially, if the world is to get access to this vaccine, India, again, is going to play a major role. And there was quite positive news just two days ago on Monday, published in The Lancet, about this vaccine, showing that it's, it's phase one and phase two uh, Tri clinical trials have gone relatively well, and it's now well into stage three clinical trials. Uh, so, so for me, global value chains, and particularly the role of China and India, are going to be essential in terms of mitigating the pandemic in terms of any treatment, but also potentially helping to end it in terms of any vaccine. And we need global value chains, and the vast majority of countries in the world do not have production capacity for drugs or vaccines, and we'll need global value chains in order to help get us out of this pandemic. That said, the pandemic has really raised so much awareness of the extent of dependence on certain countries for the production of drugs and to a similar extent of vaccines. Uh, there's been a widespread criticism of the extent of this dependence. There's been some initial moves towards combating this dependence. Uh, America has announced more than $300 million investment in an active pharmaceutical ingredient company to produce in Virginia. This company didn't even exist a year ago. India has announced an, an, the expansion of a scheme to support the production of active pharmaceutical ingredients there to, to try and reduce dependence on supply from China. There's been a lot of talk in Europe too about the need to uh, have increased production of medicines in Europe but that hasn't really been realized to much extent yet. And there's a lot of questions about the extent that will take place. And I think some lessons may be learned there from Sub-Saharan Africa, which has had a local pharmaceutical production agenda over the last decade or more, but where there's been a lot of questions about how regional blocks can coordinate to, to promote local production. If you want local production, the key question then is in whose country is the local production when it's tried to be regionally organized, whether that's in the East African community or the European Union. And whether, for example, in East Africa, Kenya, it makes a difference for a drug to be produced in Uganda or China. It's hard to know whether that uh, Kenya may just prefer a drug to be produced in China. It may not be necessarily hugely preferable to be produced in Uganda. And a similar analogy could be applied to Europe. So just to conclude, uh, I, I think pharmaceutical value chains are needed to mitigate and potentially end the pandemic. This is especially the case in the short term. In the short term, we can change the current globalized nature of the industry. Uh, there has potential and been some examples so far of nationalist policies to secure supply, but global value chains also create interdependencies between countries. And some of those nationalist moves have been relatively short uh, lived because there are also the countries putting in places, such as India, is also reliant on the US for other uh, products. China has been feared to, to try and corner 
drug supply, but hasn't actually done so yet. And China, in turn, is actually quite reliant on big pharma for certain drugs, too. Uh, I think there will be more attention to decoupling as well as cup, uh, from global value chains and global production networks and not just coupling. But there's a huge amount of questions about the extent to which that can actually be turned into reality. And I think, although we've seen a lot of talk about this in the pharmaceutical industry yet, uh, it, it may be likely in India and one or two may, big, big countries, but there's huge questions about the extent and feasibility for many, the, the vast majority of countries around the world to actually have greater local pharmaceutical production. And I'll leave it there. Okay, thanks, Rory. Uh, so now we move to the final presentation, who's going to be by uh, Professor Rafi Koplinski, uh, who's going to talk about uh, past their sell-by date, COVID GVCs, and the localization of production. Uh, Rafi is an emeritus, uh, emeritus professor fellow at the Institute of Development Studies uh, and honorary professor at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. In preparing for this presentation, he mentioned that uh, his 2005 book, on globalization, poverty, and inequality, kind of examined that issue of distributional outcome of GVCs and sort of concluded at the end that there might be internal contradictions in this system that's going to lead to the implosion of kind of globalization as a process. And as, as he mentioned to me, he had just completed a manuscript that argued that the globalization is a historically specific stage in the extension of mass production as a, as a paradigm. And even without COVID-19, uh, there will be a trend for production and consumption to be brought closer together. So it's, it's, the pandemic is not triggering this process, but it's also going to make it faster. So I think that's what he's going to talk about, kind of develop that argument further. So I'll leave it to you, Rafi. So uh, the title is self-evident. Uh, uh, are GVCs past their sell-by date? Uh, and if so, to what extent they are, what difference does COVID make in that? So I want to go back to a sense of history, uh, talking in the theoretical framework of techno-economic paradigms, which argues since the onset of the Industrial Revolution, we have witnessed five major surges or waves of economic activity. And with these surges of economic activity, there are associated political and social structures. Each wave lasts about five or six decades, but don't get uh, caught up in the periodicity, just their, their long-term phenomena. Each of these waves is driven by a core heartland technology, and with that core heartland technology is an associated development of a communications technology to widen market reach to allow for an enhanced division of labor. Each paradigm has an upswing, it has a maturity phase, and then an atrophy phase, and the new paradigm emerges as the old paradigm atrophies, and there's a picture. I've got in this picture a crash and depression, which I don't want to talk about. The key thing is on the horizontal axis, time. On the vertical axis, the dominance of particular paradigms. You can see that the uh, paradigm takes time to get going, begins with a big bang that developed with the technology. We get a period of financialization and depression, it moves into maturity and atrophy, its gains are diminished, and at the same time, this is very important, as the paradigm atrophies and declines, you get the emergence of a new paradigm. So what have the five paradigms been? The first one between approximately 1750 and 1830 was the development of water power, which gave inanimate energy to production, the canals allowed for wider distribution through England. This was followed by the development of steam power, coal base predominantly, and railways giving a greater national and increasingly in the European phrase, uh, continental uh, communications infrastructure, 1830s to uh, 1870s. Thereafter, the third paradigm driven by iron and steel with ships and telegraph beginning to give a global spread the development of a global economy, colonialism, global markets, um, again between 1870 and 1920, and then the paradigm which has dominated most of our lives, beginning with the Model T Ford in 1908 with Henry Ford, is mass production, uh, fossil fuels, particularly hydrocarbons, 
giving us a mass consumption economy uh, driven around automobiles, air transport, containerization, and globalization. That is now atrophying, as I'll uh, talk about uh, in a few minutes, and is being superseded by the new uh, paradigm, which Dev's presentation essentially addressed, which is the information and communications technology. So what happened was, if you look at this, and you don't want to get too lost in the data, uh, United Kingdom, Japan, United Kingdom, sorry, US, Japan, UK, Germany, France, Italy, from the left down to the right are periods from 50s to 73, 73 onwards, the rate of labor productivity growth. And you can see in this the golden age between 1950 and the early 1970s. It's the first of the line for each country very high rates of productivity growth. But as the decades unfold, the rate of productivity growth declines as mass production, as mass production has achieved its potential in the post-war decades and then began to atrophy in the period afterwards. This is a picture of US corporate profits. And again, I can you see my cursor? That is the period of inflection uh, after the end of the golden age and the rate of productivity growth declines through until essentially till the end of the 1980s, the mid 1990s. That is the period in which global value chains uh, took off. And they took off because capitalism had no possibility of enhancing or ensuring the profitability of its enterprises because it had gone through this mature phase, it was in its mature phase. And what globalization did was by bringing a reserve army of labor into the story, it enabled corporate profits to be sustained by uh, exploiting cheap labor. Now, things are changing. We no longer need cheap labor uh, to uh, sustain profitability because whereas the productivity gains from mass production exhausted themselves, we now have a new source of productivity growth, which is information communications technologies. And this means that profits no longer depend on cheap labor. There will be sectoral exceptions. Clothing is a one which uh, is a clear exception because of its limp material. It's very difficult to automate. But essentially, we're seeing the scope for significant productivity growth across a range of sectors and significantly not just in transformation physical inputs into physical outputs but in the service sector as well. ICTs also enable customized production and it gives enhanced capacity to near to final market production. It means that you can actually adjust to changes, very fine and rapid changes in the final market by being in production at low cost without the need for cheap labor near the final market. The point I made, which Shamir alluded to in the final chapter of my 2005 book, was that globalization through its inequalities was going to set in trend a series of political and social developments, which would make the, the as it were, the, the, the political and social infrastructure, which supported mass production, untenable. Uh, and I think we're seeing that now both domestically with the hollowing out of manufacturing with global value chains, leading for a drive to protection in the rich countries. Um, and similarly, the exclusion of many people, coterminous with the raised expectations of mass consumption in developing countries, giving a series of, uh, of, uh, of counter, what's the word I'm searching for, uh, challenges to political systems. And through the world now, we see the rise of nationalism uh, and protectionism. So what does all that say about COVID-19 and GVCs? They're not a cause of the shift from a centrifugal to a centripetal paradigm. My point is not that GVCs are going to move, are going to be destroyed completely, but the trajectory of the system is moving from an outward focus to a more inward focus, and that includes a regional focus, which is the point which Rory has made. Uh, and the COVID 19s really are not a cause of the collapse of GVCs, but they're a trigger point and a point of inflection. So there you go. I don't know whether I'm.
Am I still with you? Yes, but if you could end the screen, that would be good, the shared screen. If I knew how to do that, that would be even better. Um, yeah, stop sharing. Okay, thanks a lot, Rafi, for that. Um,